Damn it, how long have we been doing this show? The Wrestling Life. Hey, hey, everybody. It is The Wrestling Life. It is episode 366. Wow, wow, wow. If you started on March 1st listening to every show we've ever done, you would be done one show a day. You would be done by next year on March 1st. Incredible. Uh, I'm Ethan. And I'm Liam. Liam, we have so much to talk about this week. And as always, so many things we cannot talk about on the first and only wrestling podcast. WWE did a pay-per-view this past weekend at four o'clock in the morning (laughs) on the East Coast, the kickoff show. And then AEW has a pay-per-view coming up this weekend that you're going to. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll break all of these down. We can start with. Elimination Chamber since it set up WrestleMania and it's over now and <laughs> there were only five matches on the show and one of them was on the pre-show it started the 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 in-ring started at 4:30 and uh I went to bed before the main event and uh honestly I'm probably never going to go back and watch Rhea Ripley versus Nia Jax <laughs> it's just I had to Uh, I was on call for the New Japan show that took place hours earlier that night. And by the time the main event got in the ring at, oh, 8.15 or 8.20 a.m. Well, you know what? I could watch Nia Jax wrestle or I could go to bed. (laughs) So I I chose to go to bed. Well, I I don't blame you. (laughs) Did you see the show? What did you think of the show? Yeah, it was it was. The wrestling was fine. <laughs> and as someone who didn't watch it live, I it's like a it's a tight two hours, like you know, a little over two hours to get Oof. through all of the stuff you actually want to see. Oof. If you watch this show live, I imagine it's one of the worst WWE shows of all time. Because <laughs> as all of these recent Peacock shows feel like the worst show of all time, uh, because there is so much faffing about and so much lollygagging and ads being run and <laughs> between between our matches and product placement being done and little skits to do more product placement and video game commercials and whatever else they have to do. Uh, uh, as many people pointed out, there was nearly an entire hour between matches at one point on the show. So, Correct. yeah, I imagine yes. if you watched this show live, it was uh, excruciating. But as, uh, as someone as who you, watched it later, it was fine. <laughs> as you pointed out, this is a product that punishes you for watching live. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no. <laughs> it's like the, the pay-per-view is almost even, even worse than the regular television now. It's like, you know, three-hour live Raw is, is tough to get through. But, uh, you know it's you've never it would be hard to make an argument well maybe some of those shows in like the near the end of the year but then an entire hour goes by on a regular raw with like nothing of note happening at all (laughs) uh but they managed to pull that off on this pay-per-view so uh yeah i thought it was thought it was fine i liked the women's chamber that was probably the best match on the show. Um, it was really funny that there was one heel in the match and she was the most over baby face in the match. <laughs> um, and yeah, the men's chamber was fine. They that match was a, they set up like three WrestleMania matches in that match. Yes. <laughs> uh, Cause uh, with Logan Paul and Randy Orton and LA Knight and AJ Styles. And, uh, and of course drew winning the chamber to get the title shot at Seth. So, it was like it was an effective show as far as getting getting guys and girls in position for for mania, obviously with Becky winning the chamber. So uh it 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 was it was serviceable as far as what the matches on the show accomplished, I would say. Uh it's useless to complain about the Nick Conification of these pay-per-views, mm. but holy crap. <laughs> The tourism ads for wherever city they're in. Mm-hmm. 
all of the Peacock commercials or the commercials put in there for people who don't subscribe to Peacock but watch it anyway. And it's like, I think being on Peacock has led to the explosion in popularity of this product over the last two years. Sure. So it's hard to complain about that, but I still can. Uh, four, <laughs> four, four and a half hour show. As you mentioned, just under two hours of actual wrestling on the show. <laughs> it's, it's something else. Uh, Australia adopted Tiffany Stratton this weekend. Mm -hmm. They have come around to my point of view that she is the future of this industry of of uh, trademark this business. <laughs> As you mentioned, she was the only heel in the women's chamber. She was also the most over baby face in the women's chamber. <laughs> Um, I thought the wrestling for the most part on this show was just meh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Becky was trying when she was in there with uh, Naomi and then uh, Tiffany got in there. And uh, I think everyone, I think all six got in there before anyone was eliminated. Um, Becky was trying. <laughs> um Naomi tries hard. She's very good at trying. <laughs> uh, Tiffany does what she does, mm -hmm. which included a swanton off the off a pod. I was gonna, I was hoping she would try a moonsault off the pod, but honestly, she jumps so damn high. I I don't know that it would have been safe. So the swanton was probably the way to go there. And uh, yeah, yeah, good times there. Men's chamber, a lot of clubbering. You know what I mean? A lot of squeezing. Uh huh. <laughs> Real uh, 2006 uh, OVW special. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Bobby Lashley. I think he was going in with an injury anyway. Like they did an angle mm -hmm. on SmackDown where he, they taped up his arm and then they they put him in there uh, fourth, and he was the first guy out. <laughs> well, I I would assume. I don't know how much of it is his injury was just being 47 years old or whatever and how much of it was he actually has an injury, but it was an old chamber too. Like Randy's in his mid forties. Kevin Owens is my age. LA Knight's in his early forties. Bobby Lashley's in his late forties. Drew is in his late thirties. Uh, LA and uh, Logan Paul is, I don't know, 25 or whatever, but uh, wow. That was an old men's chamber match. It's an old roster. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a, it's it's funny because it's a roster that Vincent Mann would like, and it's a lot of sizzle and not a lot of steak, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> which is what he sold for forty years. Sure. Um, I don't know. I don't know. It's just it, there is. I mean, there. But he you, wouldn't like it because they're all forty. <laughs> Although he did they're all forty change his mind on on that. Uh, you're done when you're forty thing. Uh, in the last five years, yeah. When when he couldn't make a new star, <laughs> and and all he had were stars who were over forty. He had no choice but to embrace that. Yeah, true. So, Although anyway. it still feels like the tippy top guy can't be can't be over forty. Because like the second Cena tur turned forty, he was down, and Roman's yeah. not, not Roman's not forty yet. So, <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. Um, I mean, and the quote unquote work great guys on this show were Finn Balor and Damian Priest, who are both over forty, mm -hmm. and uh, wrestling Pete Dunne and Tyler Bate, who are not anywhere near forty, but both look it. I was gonna say. <laughs> And they're both five foot two. Uh huh. <laughs> so that's what I hated that. All right. So that was a great elimination chamber <laughs> show. They, Wonderful they, variety show. They ran this press event the day before where uh, it, I, I don't know why these things exist. I hope this doesn't become a th thing with every show now. They did a press event in Australia and uh, Michael Cole started off by saying, we had to ship the elimination chamber. Um, we had to fly it from. Originally, we were going to ship it through the Suez Canal. This was going to travel entirely by ship to Perth, Australia. Mm -hmm. However, it was waylaid by pirates, <laughs> and 
And so we had to fly the chamber from Los Angeles to Perth and where it was then, or yeah, anyway, or we flew it from Connecticut to Los Angeles. Then we put it on a boat from Los Angeles to Perth. And then we put it on a train or to Sydney. And then from we put it on a train from Sydney to Perth. It's like, I thought this was just announcer BS. And then like, because I was supposed to cover this thing, I just wrote about there being a new match on the, the pre-show. <laughs> and then the next day, people are like, uh, why didn't you write about the pirates? And I'm like, wait a minute, that was real? <laughs> <laughs> That's... That sounded totally fake. They were pirates. It sounds like a story that Jesse the Body Ventura would tell at the start of a Saturday Night's Main event. Yes, <laughs> about how they about how they had to fight a bunch of pirates to get to Australia to to put on this show. I thought he was joking. <laughs> I thought it was just Michael Cole stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. Sorry, I didn't write about the pirates. <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> well, I hope you've learned a valuable lesson. <laughs> I'm on the thinnest of ice. <laughs> like the corpse of Pat Batters. <laughs> I don't know. Oh man. Yeah, no, that uh I guess main event was uh was was Rhea and and uh and Nye, as you mentioned, you didn't see it. It was it was all right. <laughs> it's the probably that... the best effort that Naya has put in in a few years at this point. The two things I saw from that were I saw Naya messing up trying to take a flying head scissors Mm -hmm. and i saw ria flexing her butt cheeks i saw both of these in gif form on uh x yeah the like the memorable spot is naya tries to give her the samoan drop through the table it doesn't break so she like stands on the i think like either cole or graves's chair and like does a flying elbow off the chair through the table yeah i was like that was that was about the like I said, it was it was all right. Uh, crowd liked Rhea, obviously. Real big rib on this cr- giant crowd they had to put to do a show with four matches, and two of the matches are in a giant cage where you can't see anything. Yeah, as we uh, talked about last week. So real real funny thing to do this elimination chamber in the uh, in the stadium show. Uh, but hey, you know you got you got play sets to sell. I'm sure so you got to have elimination chamber on the show every year. The stadium looked great. Oh yeah, great looking set. Yep, great looking set, and uh, like the show started in daylight, but by like the uh, by the time the first match was over at the two hour mark, uh, <laughs> <laughs> like the sun had started the set. It looked really nice. Mm-hmm. All right, well that's our wonderful. Uh, that was a wonderful variety show known as Illumination Chamber Perth. Mm-hmm. Uh, WrestleMania build starts in earnest. Presumably on SmackDown on Friday with The Rock being there. And The Rock's going to be there for a few weeks in a row. And um, The Raw after Elimination Chamber. Mm, pretty uh, pretty missable. <laughs> yeah. Pretty darn missable. So maybe they'll start building on SmackDown this week when The Rock's there. And we'll figure out what The Rock is actually doing at WrestleMania. Because they did have Cody challenge Rock to what appeared to be a singles match. That was the angle in Australia. Yeah. Um, that would be interesting. I don't oh. know if that would be insane. <laughs> <laughs> That's a terrible idea. I mean, you're just inviting both guys to get hurt. Um, if you put that on night one or whatever. Yeah. Um, but. <laughs> Which is why, I mean, everyone seems to resign themselves to the tag match on night one. And then, you know, Seth and Seth defends his belt on night two and Roman defends against Cody on night two. So I don't, I feel like we already have the match unless they're worried that Seth's still banged up and he can't work twice. Um, but I'm sure you could just find another partner for Cody if that was the case. Could be that. Could be uh, trying to get the Rock to do a match in Saudi. Oh, it's a possibility down the road. Yeah, I'm not sure. I don't know why you would shoot the angle for that match before Mania if it wasn't happening at Mania. But we'll find out on Friday, I suppose. The important thing is that after 
a five year title reign and two years of Cody versus Roman that the most important character is The Rock. You know, he's uh, it was very important that he came back and joined the board. That's right. And, and this was uh, always the plan. I will remind you. <laughs> I have no earthly idea what the plan was. <laughs> no idea what the plan was. Paul Heyman was on Raw in San Jose this week. Do you think he was there to have a little talk with somebody? Could be. <laughs> <laughs> He's there to just spill his guts. Paul Heyman is like the penguin in many ways. <laughs> oh, very much so. So we'll find out what happens uh, there in WWE land. Uh AEW has Revolution coming up this weekend, Sting's retirement match. They had a go-home show on Wednesday that I thought was bizarre. Mm-hmm. Just a lot of stalling, and apparently there's a lot of injuries going around, and uh, Miro and uh, I forget who else he wanted in Meat Madness, or not going to be in Meat Madness because they weren't available because they were hurt. Keith Lee. Mm. A lot of people are hurt. Uh Nobody has come out and said they have COVID, but it sounds like uh, Tony Khan referenced the pandemic influencing things uh, last week also. So injury bug, COVID bug, a lot of things going around the EW and uh, a pay-per-view uh, this weekend that really Sting's retirement match sold all the tickets, you assume that it's going to sell all the pay-per-views anyway. And so I don't think they necessarily needed to do a uh, a crazy go-home show, but I th- think it's uh, very rare that you see AEW punt to the degree that they punted their go-home show on Wednesday night. Uh, thoughts on the go-home Dynamite, and then we can uh, preview uh, Revolution match by match. Yeah, I think you kind of hit on if it was a very missable show. Uh, the final segment with with Sting coming down from the rafters was was neat, but uh, other than that, there wasn't really anything uh, that I thought was like effective in building interest in the pay per view. It was all very pattern holding, and again, like you said, I'm sure injuries and and people being out for whatever reason uh, maybe affected that, but it was just all it felt very boilerplate stuff and. It felt like maybe a show you'd get you get a lot of these segments like three weeks out from the pay-per-view <laughs> more than on your uh, your go home show. I liked the the I liked everyone's effort in the Joe Swerve Hangman opening promo. Um that, I th- that was bad WWE to me. <laughs> yeah, like I, th- I thought I like I thought Joe's delivery was good. I thought everyone's delivery was good. And I know you and I and everyone else listening to this knows the real life thing, which is that, as we talked about last week, some sort of ongoing personal issue that Hangman Page has been having. And there was a chance he was going to miss the show. So that's why they did the fake ankle injury. Right. Um, that's fine. We all know that's the real reason. Nobody, Nobody's mad. <laughs> I know a lot of you think Hangman Page tried to push himself <laughs> out of... <laughs> The main event of Revolution, <laughs> but he's not that kind of a guy. He wouldn't do that to himself. That's right. But uh, but as it played out on TV, they didn't call attention to his ankle injury last week on television. And then this week on TV, he comes out on a crutch, says he's going to miss the show. Swerve comes out to kind of taunt him and then turn his attention to Joe only for it to be a big swerve. And Hangman's fine, and he beats Swerve up with a with a crutch, and it's a three way anyway. So on on one segment we went from Hangman is a is hurt to Hangman's not hurt to we're getting a singles match now for the world title to wait no it's just kidding it's a three way it felt very like I don't know nineteen ninety nine crash crash route like eight eight things eight weeks of angles happening in one segment type of thing. Yes. Yeah. Um, and again, we I we understand there's a real life reason for it, but the way it was played off on TV, I thought was dumb uh, and not not super effective at like building a a world championship match on pay per view. But uh, like you said, and like we talked about a little bit off the air, 
when you're this banged up and you're just trying to get across the finish line, I think sometimes it's increasingly common uh, more so maybe, maybe not as much in AEW, but to just see a show like this where it's, we are filling out our contractually obligated two hours of primetime programming on the TBS network. And we're just going to get in and get out and nobody gets hurt and nobody does anything uh, crazy. (laughs) So that's what it felt like to me on this show. So there's nothing, nothing particularly like horrible or wrong with the show, but uh, nothing uh, particularly interesting uh, other than maybe that go home angle with, uh, with the Bucks and Sting and Darby. But uh, even that I felt like was a little bit overstuffed doing the, the, the <laughs> Darby in the crowd with the Sting mask. Then Flair comes out and pretends he's turning heel, but then doesn't. And then the Bucks beat up Ric Flair and then Sting comes down from the rafters and he and Darby beat up the Bucks. Like they did a lot, but uh, I don't know. I guess they just wanted to have one, one big memorable nitro style ending brawl with Sting since it's his last dynamite. That's fine. And I understand it's wrestling, but uh, it was very, very it's very funny that in storyline Sting waited around (laughs) while Darby and Rick got the absolute mess kicked out of them uh, because he had to get a he had to get his ceiling spot in. Yes. <laughs> he had to wait uh, for his music to be cued <laughs> before he could lower himself down very slowly. <laughs> and uh, and then uh, and then he and, and then he and Darby could uh, could clean house. <laughs> I think uh, you called it on the show uh, whenever we last recorded last week, I don't know. <laughs> Times of fluid concept. Sure, sure. But you were so you know you were. I think you put it out. You're like you know Rick wants to take some bumps. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like you know Rick's got to be in here taking bumps. He didn't really take a bumps per se, but he did take a low blow and was out there throwing chops with his one arm that he can't raise. Yes, because he uh, had a rotator cuff injury or a tricep injury or whatever that he never got fixed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Unreal. Absolutely unreal. There's I do not to find a way. <laughs> I do not need to see seventy four year old Ric Flair trying to take bumps. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't need to see him at all. But but yeah, to your point, yeah. Uh, don't don't need him involved <laughs> on Sunday. No, I'm sure he'll be there because it's Greensboro and it's Sting's last match. And have him come out after the match and give give Sting a hug. That's fine. <laughs> a an open mouth kiss. <laughs> Sure. <laughs> like how he kissed his wife at their fake wedding. <laughs> what? <laughs> Remember that picture? It was gross. No. No, I don't. Thanks for uh thanks for ruining my night. <laughs> yep. <laughs> All right. Uh we could preview uh revolution now. Uh so you're driving or are you flying down? Driving. Renting a car and driving. Ooh. Could you fly if you wanted to? I glanced at flights but i couldn't find anything direct where i could fly out of the baltimore airport to the north carolina airport so okay i would at minimum like be driving to like delaware or somewhere to then fly to uh, north carolina <laughs> and amount of time seemed to be a wash at best if not more time it would take me to get there and back doing that that uh zigzagging to get to the flight so i see so this show is sunday night so are you driving sunday morning mm-hmm. okay and then driving, are you driving sunday morning uh have a have a hotel the sheraton and okay uh, in uh in, don't give out your room uh, number no don't give not. out your room number <laughs> not no there's there's uh i'm sure i'm sure i'm sure rick will yeah if, he, if anybody asks him but uh no uh, yeah, I will be. Uh, I will be there and uh, staying in Greensboro, and then uh, check out the next morning. Drive home. Rent, rental cars got to be back in uh, in my neck of the woods at like five p.m. So gotta gotta make it work. It's like a five five and a half. It's like depending on when you check the GPS, it's like between like five hours and ten minutes and five hours and thirty five minutes. So adding time where like you have to stop to get gas and uh, eat or whatever. I imagine, uh, you know, maybe six, six and a half is what I'm looking at, but. Okay. That's not, that's not as bad as I 
thought for some reason. Like I'm not I'm not sure where geographically Greensboro is in North Carolina. Me either. <laughs> All right. Good but time. Thankfully the machines do. So yeah. All right. Well, I was just curious about the logistics of your trip there. That's uh oh yeah, and then I good allegedly luck. allegedly I'm gonna be working on Tuesday morning. So good luck. We'll see. <laughs> well, Godspeed. <laughs> I wouldn't do this for just anybody <laughs> or for just any match. Sure. So yeah. say, uh, I don't think Sting's ever going to have another retirement match. So, <laughs> and I don't think it would be against the young bucks if it was. So, yeah, this is your dream match. You've been uh, talking about it on the show for four years. Correct. Years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was uh, thinking I'm usually thinking about either uh mercedes money or trish stratus but mm-hmm. i was uh thinking um when i went to uh iowa a couple of years ago when trish stratus got inducted in, into the uh national wrestling hall of fame i was mm-hmm. you know i said to uh my lovely wife i said you know the number of people on the planet forget uh wrestlers the number of people i would get on an airplane for is very 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 small (laughs) it's like well i got on an airplane to iowa for trish and i'm getting on an airplane to boston in a couple weeks for mercedes so there you go uh then again to make this about me the protagonist of life uh i just want to talk about me well as you as you talked about your uh your trip to uh see stinks retirement well we're commiserating because i was mentioning (laughs) i i wouldn't I wouldn't make a trip like this for a lot of, uh, I did, I did travel. I did fly to Chicago for the first all out a few years ago. Uh, but I do not generally enjoy long travel of any kind. So no, it's, <laughs> it's gotta terrible. be a big deal. It's gotta be a big deal to, uh, to get me off the couch, uh, and, uh, and into the arena. So it's horrible. And, Delta Airlines, I love Delta Airlines, mm-hmm. but uh, they tried to, they tried to, I wasn't even going to Chicago. They tried to strand me in Chicago for, uh, it was going to be overnight. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, well, no, <laughs> we can't do that. <laughs> Don't do that to us. So then they eventually had to fly us to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and then we had to Uber from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania to Baltimore. Can you imagine? Oh, yeah. <laughs> what a, what a nightmare. Anyway, love Delta. Uh-huh, uh-huh. <sighs> well, I hope you enjoy your trip to uh, see Sting. Let's talk about Revolution. All right. There is an all-star scramble match on this program mm-hmm. in p- place of Meat Madness. I believe uh, Excalibur said very, very quickly, God, God bless him, <laughs> that this is for a title shot of some kind. <laughs> The winner gets a future world title shot, correct? Okay. And uh, several of the guys who would have been in Meat Madness will also be in this, and that's uh, Wardlow, Powerhouse, Hobbs, Lance Archer, and Brian Cage. There's also four little fellas that are going to be in the match. <laughs> Chris Jericho. Eh, well. Me- medium-sized fellow, maybe. <laughs> sure. Hook, Magnus from CMLL, and Dante Martin. Spoiler alert for those who haven't seen Rampage or <laughs> Collision this weekend. Sure. sure. Uh, yeah. So uh, eight guy scramble match sounds terrible. Yeah, you know, you get the big guys to catch the little guys on all their dives. And it's a, it's just a classic modern pro wrestling thing where we can't just leave these guys off the show. Chris Jericho well, Jer- did not have a pay-per-view match. Exactly. He he was away for three weeks touring with Fozzie in Europe or whatever, and he came back and realized, wait a minute, there's a pay-per-view this weekend and I'm not on it? We need a remedy to this immediately, Anthony. Let's do it. But unfortunately for him, he can't uh, drag Tatesha down again or or, uh, or or somehow be Will Ospreay's first AEW opponent. Uh, so he had to uh, it put himself in this Rando multi man match. I guess Hobbs is in this, so they can they can continue their wonderful feud that's been going on 
uh, since before we started this podcast, I think. <laughs> yes, I think that's correct. So we come up on our 10th anniversary. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there was, by the way, there was a uh, a rubber match on uh, Dynamite this week between Chris Statlander and Sky Blue. Mm-hmm. And uh, they s- were selling it as a rubber match in their best of three series. And it's like, first of all, uh, you just decided this week that this was a best of three series. Mm-hmm. Uh, second of all, to their credit, I don't think they ever actually tried to sell it as best of three, but they were like, this is the rubber match. Mm-hmm. And then I w- went back and looked, and it's like, well, they wrestled once in October, and then they wrestled in December. <laughs> And then match three in this series was in the last show of February. So over the course of four months, every 90 days, they have a match. And this is long, long term storytelling. I I don't know what they're doing. (laughs) Is Julia hurt? Is she one of the people that's hurt? I don't know, man. Because she hasn't wrestled in like three months, seemingly. And no earthly idea. Let me, uh, well, we can, uh, we can look at when Julia Hart wrestled last. I think she wrestled in, they did like a big multi woman tag on the Daily's Place Dynamite. She wrestled on Battle of the Belts uh, on January 13th. Okay. So right after that. (laughs) Correct. Three days after that. Uh, yeah. She hasn't wrestled in, uh, coming up on two months here. So okay. I guess I don't know, and uh, who could blame you if you missed the uh, Battle of the Belts Nine? <laughs> <laughs> Is that the one where they tried to hide Chris Jericho from getting booed? Uh, yeah, yes, okay. I think that I is saw correct. That show, but who, who could remember? Yeah, uh, the other matches on that program were Orange Cassidy against Preston Vance, <laughs> and I think it kicked Arrow off Hella Grosso. <laughs> yes. And it kicked off with a world tag team title street fight with Big Bill and Ricky Starks against Jericho and Sammy in a match. Uh, Dave Meltzer gave four and a quarter stars. <laughs> it's, n- it's not a joke. Uh, no, I know it's not. He gave it four and a quarter stars. Oh, man. Well, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, FTR is wrestling the BCC. At Revolution, Dax Harwood and Cash Wheeler, speaking of little fellas, mm-hmm. will be taking on uh, Moxley and Claudio. And um, Dax Harwood, uh, Uncle Drunky, went on uh, social media and was insinuating sometime last week that uh, Moxley had gotten his promo pulled from TV. <laughs> and instead, Moxley got his full two and a half minute promo or whatever on rampage or collision or whatever. Uh, I, I can. So the, the scenario was it was the week they didn't have a collision. Right. Of the all-star game or whatever. Correct. So they only had rampage. Usually those post dynamite promos all air on collision, but sure. this time they only had the, the 7 PM rampage or whatever on Friday right. night and no collision. So right. yes, Moxley and Claudio's post match promo aired, but theirs did not. And naturally it's a conspiracy. My question is, do you really think Dax thinks that Moxley put out a political hit on him? Or is Dax uh trying to work the internet? Uh probably both. <laughs> <laughs> There's only one thing that I'm sure about Dax Harwood when he's tweeting. Yeah. And that's that he uh, has maybe had a few, th- a few drinks. He has a glass with three fingers in it in one hand and a beard trimmer in the other. Correct. That's, uh, uh, that's, that's my only assumption uh, about Dax Harwood's tweets at this point. But uh, I don't, I don't feel like these guys are gelling super well. <laughs> Maybe it's because Moxley and Claudio look like Andre the Giant and they're in there with these guys. Um, but uh, maybe it's because there's not like a clear dynamic to it. I mean, like Moxley choked out Dax after the match the other week. So I guess they're kind of the heels in the program, but not really. And uh, <laughs> FTR are, you know, they're they're popular. Everybody cheers when they come out and they have good matches most of the time. So Nobody really wants to boo anyone, but it just doesn't feel like they're 
gelling uh in in at least in the the draw that they had on television or the six man they had on dynamite this week it didn't really feel like either match was like a oh man they're they're really ramping up to something here um but the ftr still has a very strong track record as a team uh moxley and claudio have both had good matches so yeah this theoretically should be good on paper it looks like a really good match but I have not seen any evidence on the actual TV show yet, but it will be a good match. The anytime any of mix of these four guys are in with each other, it's like a fascinating science experiment that I'm watching. <laughs> it's like trying to see, okay, who's going to sell for who? And it's like, it's not like FTR is unprofessional or anything. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? It's like, they're going to, they're going to do whatever it takes to have a good match. And it's like, I don't think Moxley are, I mean, Claudio is not a professional whatsoever. And I'm not trying to insinuate that Moxley is unprofessional, but Moxley doesn't sell for a lot of guys. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, no, he's, he does. And I'm not saying thing. he should. He, he doesn't sell. He doesn't sell. He doesn't sell. And then he finally starts taking bumps for you. Like, right. And that, you know, it's his deal. He's, you know, number two guy in the company or whatever. Sure. It's his prerogative. And I, I just finished his audiobook and found him to be delightful, which <laughs> I would not have thought going in, honestly. I would have thought, you know, this is a nice guy and everything. I'm not trying to say I didn't think he was a nice guy. I just didn't think I would enjoy John Moxley's company for nine hours. And uh, I did. Wonderful audiobook. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, 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 like I said, I think <laughs> I don't know how to get out of that. But uh, no, like I said, I think I like all of these guys in the ring for the most part. Uh, but I have not felt the I have not felt strong chemistry in there with them the the last two times out. So well, there you, there you go. Will Osprey versus Kaneske Takeshita? Don't know that I need to see this. People uh people love them some Osprey and they love them some Takeshita though, and uh, I'm sure they'll try to have a great match. Yeah, I mean they're setting up. It feels to me like I mean obviously they're already teasing the idea that like Osprey is technically in the Don Callis family, but he's not going to be for long. Right. So you, I don't know if you immediately pull the trigger on him turning on that or them turning on him or whatever. Uh, I, I imagine that Kyle Fletcher's uh, dump truck tag team partner (laughs) will be back on television soon. Mark Davis. And, uh, and so you could do, you know, dump truck. The callous, the callous family guys versus uh, Aussie Open or whatever, and and you have Osprey in the mix there too. So um, big dumper, <laughs> big dumper, <laughs> big dumper, Mark Davis. There you go. <laughs> Christian Cage will defend the TNT cha- uh, Championship against Daniel Garcia. Okay, Daniel Garcia. Everyone likes him. Uh, <laughs> everyone likes him. I don't dislike him. I like the dancing. Uh, we have a lot of evidence to suggest that behind Adam Copeland, uh, he may be number two rating, ratings killer in the company. <laughs> Fair. Or anyone not in the women's division. <laughs> if not Adam Copeland, not anyone in the women's division, then it's uh, Daniel Garcia who's going to uh, kill your quarter hour rating. Yeah, I mean, I, I I think the hardcore audience is is into him, and yeah, and look, he's he's very young, and he has time to grow into something more than he currently is. He was um, over pushed before he was ready. Mm-hmm. He and was on he... every show for a year and a half, and then they took him off TV, and then they put him back on TV and beat him every every show for another half a year, and now it's. Okay, now he's in the title match. Right, he stood stood behind Jericho, and that wonderful faction that Jericho had that got so yes. many people over. Yes, um, and now he is less over than he was uh, before he joined that faction. So yeah, but people like him, and you know Christian Cage is good at getting <laughs> getting crowds riled up at least. So yeah, I think this will be a this will be a good match, and I think the crowd will be super invested in it. Um, Christian doesn't have bad matches. It's true. I used, I used to say this about Adam Copeland until his uh, second career. 
I don't know that I've ever seen a bad Christian match. Like, I definitely never saw a bad Edge match before 2019 or whatever. Yeah. It's like, I don't know that I've ever seen a bad Christian match. Very consistent body of work. Like, just. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Always good. And not, and working with guys that he had no business getting good matches out of because. <laughs> Sure. Yoshitatsu and Matt Cardona never had matches that good again. So Matt Cardona. Ugh. What could have been? Uh international champion, Orange Cassidy defending against Roderick Strong. Um on this PD Kingdom, n- not that over as a group. Mm-mm. Um Orange probably shouldn't lose this. Uh maybe they try to Give Roddy a little juice and uh, give him a big win here. I'm not sure how this plays out. Do you have a read on it? They're back to sort of playing up the whole oranges. Orange is beat up and has defended the belt too many times. They're, they've mildly retconned <laughs> that he lost the belt once already out of. They, they talk. <laughs> they do mention that it's his two combined reigns, but they're like, he's defended the belt 45 times or whatever. It's like, between two different reigns but sure and he was off tv for a month in there but um yeah uh and the the whole the whole match he had with nick wayne this week at the end is that his back is is screwed and right he's fighting he's fighting the backbreaker guy so yeah certainly feels like they're setting you up to think roddy's gonna win the belt and if you're ever going to take this kingdom group seriously i guess they should start winning matches over <laughs> top guys <laughs> Yeah, but you know, I'd also be fine if Orange Cassidy was the international champion for another three years. So, yeah, that's fine. I thought he deserved uh, more wrestler of the year votes in the Observer uh, Reader Awards. I agree, or at least the the most outstanding category, <laughs> if not something the wrestler of the year, US MVP, any of those weird categories. Yeah, they've added like five years ago. Uh, Eddie King symbol defend the Continental Crown against Brian Danielson. Um, I as uh, Danielson's number one guy, I need to ask you if you've enjoyed this because I would like to say that uh, while I'm sure I'll enjoy the match, I have not enjoyed the feud because I don't want to dislike Brian Danielson, and he's decided he's a heel. I've kind of enjoyed it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well. I like. I think. There is something kind of fun and universal about that he just hates Eddie Kingston. <laughs> like he's not necessarily a heel when he's wrestling like the CMLL guys, but he just sure. hates Eddie Kingston and thinks he's an embarrassment to pro wrestling. So <laughs> he just wants to he just wants to mess with them. And I think that's kind of funny. So I uh, I think that uh, that consistency of, of Brian Danielson feeling that Eddie is a disappointment and not worthy of, of, uh, of adhering to the code of honor for is, uh, is kind of fun and simple pro wrestling that I, that I like, even though, yeah, nobody wants to boo Brian Danielson when he's on his, his sicko retirement tour where he's just wrestling. Yeah. Everybody he wants to wrestle in every company. So, yeah, I really enjoy the June, the uh, June Akiyama match on Mm -hmm. collision. Akiyama can go more than most of those Japanese legends who are like 50. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then, uh, Dan- <laughs> okay, June, we're going to fly uh, Akiyama san, we're going to fly you over. You're going to do a job. We're going to kick you in the balls. <laughs> and then we're going to put you on a plane and send you back home. <laughs> All right. <laughs> How much do you think he gets paid to do that? <laughs> hope, uh, I hope, 10 it's grand? At least, yeah, hope it's at least a first class flight on the way back. <laughs> business oh. class at least sure I, en- I enjoyed that though uh let's see what else do we have on this show tony storm versus diana perrazzo these <laughs> the promos have been uh entertaining <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> tony th- threatening to punch diana in various parts of her anatomy <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's it's entertaining uh Theoretically, this should be a good match. I uh Tony is the most over character in the women's division. Yeah. As we've talked about, you don't you don't have to be the champion to be the most pushed character on TV if you're a woman in AEW. So sure, look at Britt Baker. 
yeah, you could you could absolutely change the title here, and I don't think it would change either woman's stock. I think terribly. It could, it could it could help Diana. Sure. It, it, at least it would run. It would mitigate the chances of her uh, rubying. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so by where you bring them in as it with a lot of f- fanfare and then beat them very quickly and then there's not really much else for them to do. Um so yeah, you could you could put the belt on her. It probably wouldn't hurt to have a, like a and then you have a whole everyone that Tony has beaten, you now can, you know, run that back with Diana as the as the fighting babyface champion again. So it does it does freshen things up and Tony can still be free to do her little skits. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I can't believe I'm advocating for Tony Storm loss, but uh, <laughs> I think I am. Oh, well, there you go. Um, here's what we know about Deanna Praza. Uh, she's an old truck she likes to take her with, <laughs> and she loves leaking things to the dirt sheets. <laughs> very good friends with uh, <laughs> with various people that work for Fightful.com. Yeah. It's hilarious. Uh, Samoa Joe defending the world title against Hangman and a Swerve in a three-way should be fun. Yeah, I think uh, there's going to be at least one spot in this match where Hangman has a chance maybe to win, but he is so focused on making sure Swerve loses that he screws it up for himself. The one everyone is floating is that Joe has him in the choke or something, and he sees that Swerve is like coming back into the ring, and so he's going to tap out before he has to to keep Swerve from winning the belt. I see. All right, it's certainly one thing you could do. <laughs> well, I guess I well, I don't I I guess we'll have to wait and see if that was an official heel turn on. <laughs> oh, I mean on on, on Wednesday or not. But, I think I think the match, the last match they did with Swerve and Hangman, they did a draw or whatever. I think that was a double turn. I think Swerve turned babyface, Page turned heel, Page denied him the five more minutes. Feels that way. Yeah, I think that was a double turn. So at that point, uh, it seems like you can you can have him be more overtly cowardly. Um, or you could actually have Hangman win the belt and then Swerve chases him for a while. I think that's fine. I think I don't. I th- if you do that, you need, just need to make it clear that Swerve is getting it at some point. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, people are gonna lose faith <laughs> and not care when they finally do pull the trigger on it. As the uh, the generic nonsense phrase uh, I like to spout sometimes. Sometimes the right time is just the right time. <laughs> and sure. what, you, what you have in your head, if you have him, if you think you're going to crown him at double or nothing or all in or all out or whatever, or uh, forbidden door, whatever. Uh, hmm, that's several months away. <laughs> so just. he He can get it now. He can drop it to Osprey if that's the plan at all at Wembley. And he can, if he gets it now, he could have a nice five, six month run with the title before he loses it to your big money free agent. Mm-hmm. Uh, Sting and Darby versus the Young Bucks is the, uh, ma- I presume it's going on last. I don't know. It's the match that sold the show. I could see it going on second to last also, though. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I hope it's everything you want it to be. I hope so too. I did. They did a bit on Dynamite where the Bucks interrupt Eddie's uh, promo this this week, and so I've gotten it in my head that what they should do is because it's a tornado match, so it's going to be no DQ. Uh, is that the Young Bucks should bring out a bunch of geek heels at one point to beat up beat up Sting and Darby? You know, your Kip Sabians, your your Brandon Cutlers, your Jeff Jarrett crew, etc. And then Eddie and a bunch of baby faces need to run down and even the odds. And then Sting, Sting and Darby should win. <laughs> That's what I think should happen. And then and then everyone uh, comes in the ring and celebrates, which is my my favorite thing you can do at the end of a wrestling match is when the whole roster comes down to celebrate uh, the, the Stinger winning. So that's what I would do. 
Sounds fine to me. Yeah, no problem. Um, blah, blah, blah. let's see what else I want to do. Um, I wanted to mention. Um, I saw our you and talking with our pal Mike on uh on uh mm -hmm. social media about AEW attendance and ticket prices and things of that nature. Yeah. Um, obviously Greensboro is going to be their biggest crowd of the year, most likely. Yeah. Um, they could. They could do more, I guess, for Forbidden Door at Arthur Ashe. It depends, I guess, on the card, maybe for that. But they'll have over 16,000 there. And I think Boston, according to Russell Tix, for big business here in a couple of weeks, is at like 6,500, which is not a blowaway number, but would be their biggest dynamite audience of the year. Mm -hmm. And... Um, you know, I think our friend Mike was saying that uh, ticket prices are too high. Um, they shouldn't be charging ticket prices. I don't want to speak for him, but mm -hmm. um, um, yeah, maybe they should be lowering ticket prices given the fact that they've been averaging like 3,000 people at Dynamite uh, every week. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know what the answer is to that. I don't know. I don't know. I'm sure there are people. Um, I'm. I would hope that Tony Khan would have people that would be telling him, uh, "Okay, this is this is the sweet spot between maximizing our revenue and also getting enough people in the building." Right. Um, I would think they that there are people that do studies on this kind of thing, and that, but uh, I don't disagree that ticket prices are ridiculous yeah but the <laughs> wwe's ticket i mean everybody should have one 20 25 dollar just get you in the building ticket price absolutely and then and then beyond that if you want to charge a thousand dollars for ringside at a house show or whatever if people will pay it people will pay it mm -hmm. <laughs> uh but i i don't disagree but there should be a uh an economy uh, get in the building, general admission, sit in the top row of the upper deck if you if that's what you want to do. Uh, ticket price either. I don't know. I, I don't get into uh, I haven't looked at AEW's ticket prices in a while to really have an educated conversation about this, but I just wanted to bring I know there's a lot of discourse, there's a lot of pictures about uh half empty buildings, especially on the Saturday tapings going around. And I just mm -hmm. wonder if you had any thoughts on, on AEW attendance or anything like that. Yeah, I mean. I think as far as the attendance, you're right in that WWE tickets are very high or not very high, but they're, you know, comparable, if not higher and probably a little higher, especially uh, in for the, for the TV tapings and such. And they're not having any trouble <laughs> filling arenas and haven't been for years. Um, and to me, that's the difference between cold product, hot product. And I think Dynamite has been much better over the last, uh, you know, this the start of this year. <laughs> Since there, there, MJF got hurt. <laughs> coincidentally, yes. <laughs> Since there isn't a 30-minute uh, promo about friendship on the show every week, I have enjoyed the shows more. But uh, when you're cold, it's very hard to get to warm, warm up. You know, WWE went through a several-year period where they where their attendance especially at you know smackdowns and stuff when they were taping smackdowns on tuesday nights were were very cold and it's not to say the shows were bad you know i i the example i used when i was talking about mike it's like you could you know wcw in early 2001 it's not it's not a terrible show <laughs> like it's actually there's some good stuff on those shows it's uh, nowhere near as bad as it had been the previous two years that also helps <laughs> them being compared yeah. to the 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 two russo regimes and autopilot kevin sullivan booking for right 99 2000 and kevin nash booking for god's sake right um it was leagues better um but the damage had kind of been done over the previous year and it would have taken a long time and a and a consistent level of quality to build that back up and so that's not to say AEW is gonna run and and run you know 2500 seats for or tickets for the rest of the time 
but I do think it will take a while and a certain level of consistency to get people to come back out. And I also think what you and, and our friend Mike both said, which is that it, pricing is an issue. <laughs> and when you're, when you're cold, it's, it's a lot harder to justify spending. Okay. It's like, if you, if it's a family of four and it's, that's even if the tickets are 20 bucks, that's still, 80 bucks and then you're buying if you're buying food and merchandise and whatever that's you know over a hundred dollars for for a show you're not very invested in going to that's that's <laughs> and a tough ask like the, the cheapest garage downtown baltimore or the cheapest closed garage mm-hmm. downtown baltimore to the arena is 25 dollars to park absolutely <laughs> right. so like... it's a, it is an expensive ask for regular people to spend their money on this and if they're not invested in the show anyway and you're asking them to pay, you know, in some of these arenas, you know, 35, 40 bucks minimum. And yeah. they're getting feed by the ticket company and they're getting yeah. and they got to pay for parking and whatever else. Like, yeah, I, I think it's 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 all symptoms of one bigger problem, which is that it just doesn't really feel like a hot product. And that, again, that's not to say they can't fill an arena for a big match like Sting's match. And and who knows, as you know, as we get closer to the the big business show they have another two weeks to try to fill up that crowd so maybe maybe they limp across the you know nine or ten thousand mark by the time we get there maybe um but it's, it's cold product <laughs> that's the difference right now i think then wwe hot product you can kind of charge whatever you want for tickets and people will pay it because they think they're getting their money's worth and they're excited about the show and the opposite feels true for AEW right now. All right. Uh, just a couple of odds and ends as we wrap up here. Mustafa Ali won the uh, X Division title in uh, Impact. He is uh, kind of doing the non AEW indie tour, Impact, New Japan, uh, pick his schedule, pick his spots. Mustafa Ali, a uh, fantastic wrestler. Uh, horrible creative ideas <laughs> he, uh yeah his his politician character heel politician that he's been trying to do for like three years um i don't get it <laughs> i don't get why he's a politician i don't get why he's a heel politician yeah i don't uh, when he's advocating for things that like in storyline fans like yeah, <laughs> like ex- exciting matches and flips, <laughs> right? And, and new faces on top. Like, it's like okay, yeah, he, I think everybody's but... in favor of those things. Yeah, generally speaking, <laughs> wrestling fans like those things. <laughs> but he's a heel, and he wears a suit, and he stands at a podium for some reason. All right, <laughs> I don't know. Fantastic uh, wrestler. Oh yeah, really like dog shit guy. ideas. Dog shit ideas. Yeah, just I don't I don't understand, and he doesn't. I wa- so I watched a clip of his uh hit one of his like uh videos where he's at the at a podium, you know, doing like a politician speak, doing the little like Barack Obama, Bill Clinton, like you're pointing with your little thumb, you're not actually pointing right motion. But he doesn't have like that big verbose like politician giving a giving a rally speech voice. He's speaking right. kind of just like a normal guy. Yes. <laughs> Which also I feel like is just disconnect like you need to be like if you're if you're a politician speaking at a rally there's a certain effect that that needs to elicit like a certain effect on your voice that needs to have and it's just just not there (laughs) so i guess my question remains why is he a politician at all other than he had this idea to wear a suit and be a politician um and he's just held on to it for (laughs) several years now yeah Strange. Uh, Dolph Ziggler is the uh, IWGP Global Champion, beating uh, David Finley in his first title defense. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dolph Ziggler, I guess we're going to see uh, how much juice he has. He wants to wrestle Tanahashi. Tanahashi hurt his ankle. Mm-hmm. And uh, after is dropping it be... in the TV title to, to Riddle, yeah. yeah. Um, who then went on uh, Riddle. <laughs> Then went on the MMA hour this week. He was talking all about all the drugs he used Mm -hmm. and how he got popped in WWE. Uh, His failed drug test were for cocaine Mm -hmm. that he used to go to the strip club and party. 
and uh it's like i while he's got the new japan belt i'm like, sitting on the uh <laughs> sitting on the counter there ahead of him i can't imagine i don't know why new japan got in business with riddle i i don't i don't understand it in the who, least who the, is it jeff Co- i don't want to cast versions on a jeff cobb but obviously they're they were friends i don't know if they still are um he teamed i mean with they're jeff in a fact yeah they're in a faction together now so uh like did jeff cobb put in a good word for this guy like you gotta use this guy i don't know because he's working like mlw as well it's not like he's a hot property <laughs> Right. And I imagine he's not like super cheap either. He's um, made enough money as he, he's pointed out like the art, his RK bro run uh, was like the run where he's like, okay, I, I can like, I can pay for, pay my house off now. Right. <laughs> like, so I don't know. So I, yeah, I question why other than you're just panicking <laughs> because everyone is leaving. <laughs> I don't yeah, I don't know. There is some of that. Um we'll see. I not a big Dolph Ziggler guy. Really? Uh, yeah, really. Uh however, I'm willing to give him more of a chance than Riddle, frankly. Yeah, <laughs> Maybe... I mean that's a <laughs> the bar is, the bar is hell, low, yes. <laughs> the bar is low. Uh Naito uh, Okada finished up. Okada did no jobs on the way out. My hero. Beat everybody. And uh, then in his last New Japan segment, uh, they had him come out to confront Naito after Naito beat Sonata to retain the title. And um, they were doing like a face-to-face, and then Naito went after Okada. And I thought, oh, wow, Naito's just going to beat him, like even if it wasn't a match. Right. Like, he's going to leave him laying in an angle. <laughs> uh wow he is gonna put somebody over on the way out but instead they just kind of did uh, a stare down kind of thing and yeah. uh they did a little bit of physicality but it was the, they brawled to a stalemate <laughs> and then okada just left mm-hmm. <laughs> like wow he's not even giving naito the rub on the way out <laughs> he put over no one he lost no matches on the way out uh-huh he had championships that he just vacated he didn't lose in the <laughs> ring and uh, I guess Fightful reported this week, Okada's almost assuredly going to AEW, and uh, he'll be. They are hoping that he'll be in uh, by next Wednesday, I guess. So uh, we'll see. Yeah, <laughs> I assume he's. I mean, I don't. I don't think it's a stretch to say that he's in. Right. I don't know that. Uh, I don't know where he'll debut. It would just, seem, we've been yeah. talking about it for weeks. Like the double debut thing just made so much sense to me. Yeah. Once we started talking about it. So the idea that he's going to debut in front of like 1500 people in Duluth, Georgia or wherever. Right. Instead of on the show in front of whatever their biggest crowd of the year for dynamite ends up being. Right. I, w- I would guess 8,000 or so. Yeah. I don't know. Once they get, they get people in there and they start doing local media the last couple of days. I think about 8,000 is a nice number, but yeah. we'll see. Again, we're not lighting the world on fire here, but it's <laughs> it will be their biggest their biggest crowd of the year. And uh, you think that since they're doing Arthur Ashe for Forbidden Door, they're not doing Grand Slam, which seems like a good idea. <laughs> Perception, I mean, uh, practically, what, pract- from a practicality standpoint, I agree with you. From a perception standpoint, I mean, we've established that money is no object here. Right. So, is it is it got good? a lot more money than the Crockett's? I've I've heard a lot more money than Jim Crockett ever did. Uh, is it perception wise? Is it a good thing to s- stop running your stadium show? I mean, you've established yeah. we're running the stadium show three years in a row. We're not doing it year four. I don't know. I I felt that now that you have all in and all out and then Arthur Ashe two weeks later one of those has got to move oh it's a disaster (laughs) so and especially if you're also going to run a pay-per-view in October now and November and December like you you you, so you could do a big time dynamite but you got to do it in like January now (laughs) yes um so that would be my suggestion maybe you don't do it this fall and then 
uh, you know, well, you can't do an outdoor tennis stadium in January, I guess, in New York City, but uh, figure it out. I get your point. I get, I get your point. There is, I mean, I think there is a retractable roof on it. They just have okay. always chosen to run it outdoors in September or whatever. Right. So maybe, yeah, you could, you could definitely do a big, a big arena or stadium dynamite in one of the months where you don't have a pay-per-view. But now you're now that they're going to be running like eight or nine pay-per-views a year, there's less places where I feel like it makes sense to put it. Yeah. Yeah. No argument. No objections. <laughs> All right. Uh, we've uh, spanned the globe. We've talked an awful lot. Is there anything else you'd like to discuss? Uh, if I could, I'd just like to read uh, the things uh, that fall under rock IP. Uh all right. Via his new agreement with TKO Enterprises. Uh, all that right. Gives him uh, the right to all his copyrights. Sure. Go for it. All right. Rock IP means any and all intellectual property rights throughout the world at any time owned by the TKO group parties, etc. The following, uh, any of these are registered or unregistered. They now are owned by The Rock. And the following taglines. The Rock, Rocky Maivia, Team Corporate, Rock Nation, The Nation. Rudy Poo, Candy Ass, Jabroni, if you smell what the rock is cooking, the Samoan Sensation, the Blue Chipper, the Brahma Bull, the People's Champion, the Great One, Know Your Role and Shut Your Mouth, Team Bring It, oh, that was a great one, The Rock Just Bring It, The People's Elbow, Rock Bottom, Finally the Rock Has Come Back To, It Doesn't Matter What, Blue Hell, The Millions, parentheses, and Millions, Rock Apocalypse, Project <laughs> Rock, and the most electrifying man in sports and entertainment, and all logos associated with those intellectual properties. Dwayne got them all. Sure, why not? Have you seen his uh, big Dwayne Energy commercials for Zoe Energy? No, <laughs> I have not. That sounds wonderful. Yeah, they're they. Uh... Wonderful variety show uh, commercials. What the hell is Rock Apocalypse? <laughs> When's he gonna bust that one out? Blue Hell. <laughs> yes. That seems some of these seem hard to enforce. Yeah, I don't know. Anyway, uh, yeah. Almost every night, I walk past a uh, GNC store that mm-hmm. has uh, both a Zo Energy drink. A uh, poster and a poster for some kind of protein powder or pre workout or something, but the rock is hawking. Uh, so, uh, in in their uh, display windows, so I see like two giant cardboard cutouts of Dwayne every night, and I yeah, always think of how much Dwayne. <laughs> I almost th- I always think of how much he dislikes it. <laughs> I am just pointing out <laughs> what this man is. <laughs> I am offering no commentary. <laughs> He exists to sell products. Right. That's fine. That's fine. And uh, you just also can't... uh, You shouldn't also try to be the guy who drives a big truck (laughs) and owns a farm in Virginia. America's best friend. That's right. If you break down on the side of the road, Dwayne will be there to help you change your tire. That's right. All right. Good times, everybody. Uh, Until next time, I'm Ethan. And I'm Liam. We'll be back soon with more stories from the wrestling life. Bye bye. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to leave us a five star review on Apple Podcasts. Now, here are this week's bonus features. We didn't get to talk about it last year, but uh, last week. But uh, Frazier's Frazier's coming back for another season. It is. I um, self-proclaimed giant Frazier fan have only watched one episode of the uh, of the new <laughs> reboot. Not not protesting it necessarily, just not no enthralled with it. No, I saw the pilot because I could watch it on my phone on YouTube. Mm-hmm. because they put the whole pilot up on YouTube. And it's like, okay, well, 
I uh, I don't know the Paramount Plus login off the top of my head. We don't we don't have it written down anywhere. I have to ask my wife what the Paramount Plus login is. <laughs> I also don't know the Netflix or Hulu logins. <laughs> I don't know. I think I know the HBO Mac or the Max login because I set that one up. Mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. just have to go through a lot of <laughs> infrastructure <laughs> to set up Paramount Plus on all of our devices. It's just like it was not so great. The pilot was not so great that uh, I immediately wanted to rush home and do that. And now it's just been like uh, four months or whatever, and just got on living my life, you know. Yeah, no, that's fair. Is there? I'll get, I'll get to it someday. Okay. You know? I was gonna say, is there a former cast member if they announce like uh, the brother is back for season two or something? Would that entice you to catch up? Or I, I, I don't, I don't. I don't know. <laughs> as as we've talked about off the air, not here on Fraser Observer Radio, mm-hmm. but as we've talked about off the air, the magic of the original show, it was a true ensemble cast. Mm-hmm. It was Fraser, who's this aristocratic buffoon, but you end up rooting for him anyway, in spite of him being an aristocratic buffoon, um, because the whole ensemble cast was just so damned likable. And he is the only member of said Bailey. ensemble cast that returns. So um, they have his uh, ex-wife Lilith does a cameo in the new one. Mm-hmm. Who She played the role all the way back on Cheers and then would pop in once or twice a season on Frasier as well. So that's nice. And Roz makes a cameo this season or in the first season. And she was a part of the ensemble. But uh much of the magic of the show was uh, Frazier and Niles and Martin and Daphne and Roz. And now it's just Frazier. And they've tried to make Frazier his dad in the mm-hmm. reboot and his son Frazier in the reboot. And they have Niles' son as an avatar for Niles in the uh <laughs> in the reboot and it's uh it's all very clunky do you have to like reverse the dynamic though because like it's like the dad is like salt to the earth regular guy right frazier and niles are very hoity-toity from the instagram clips you sent me i've never seen an episode (laughs) but you're spot on you're spot uh, on so do we reverse that now so now frazier as the dad is hoity-toity and the son is like a cool salt of the earth normal guy is that the yes that the vibe now you got it okay I don't, the I don't... son, the son is a firefighter, uh, and uh, Fraser is a wealthy aristocrat. Whereas uh, in the in Fraser, the dad is a retired police officer, and okay. Fraser is a wealthy aristocrat. <laughs> so there was definitely a meeting where they're like, "Well, we can't have the son be a cop because that's now like a correct political hot button job. Right? We can't. Right. That's not a salt of the earth regular guy job anymore." Well, although Kelsey Grammer, Mr. MAGA. Sure. Yeah. And he is, he is, I assume, like executive producing this show. Of course. I mean, that doesn't mean anything. You know, you sure. just get your, you get your name on the door and probably a little cut of the back end. Yeah. But, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. I'm, I'm just trying to say he wouldn't be opposed to, um, <laughs> uh, portraying police as good guys. Oh, sure. I just imagined that he's also a guy. That's, similarly to like a tim allen where like it's not a secret that he is what side of the aisle he rests on but he's been pretty good at keeping himself brand safe oh yeah for sure i mean mercy free for he still gets work oh yeah (laughs) like there's a there's a there's a way to navigate that field yeah and he's very good at that yeah i mean as long as you don't publicly denounce groups of people or something Mm -hmm. (laughs) and assuming you are talented to begin with and you're not like kevin sorbo or uh uh i don't know i can't think of another dean (laughs) kane it's like you'll probably get work yeah 
<sighs> we don't have anything to talk about. It's going to be a really quick show. And then we'll Hour start. and 17 minutes later, <laughs> here we are. It's one of the longer shows we've ever done. <laughs> <laughs> As it turns out. I try to keep on keeping on.